You are listening to The Gateway Church, located in Ferrisburg, Michigan. You can learn more about us by visiting thegateway.church or like and follow us on Facebook, where you can watch full services, keep up with all that is going on, and get connected. Man, it's good to be here this morning. Thanks for everything, Pastor Bobby, for uh, the worship team, for sure. Well, this morning, I just want to remind us, we have been in a series called Devoted. Everybody say, Devoted. We've talked about being devoted to the apostles' teaching, and when we talked about that, we had a bunch of vintage bikes up here. That was six weeks ago. That seems like a long time ago, uh, but James Zeidema and his collection, he was devoted to bicycles, but we weren't talking about being devoted to bicycles. We were saying, no, we're devoted to God's Word. God's Word is powerful, right? It's precious to us. And in this series, we did a 21-day devotional together uh, called The Church. And for those of us that did that, which was a bunch of us, it was powerful. And I just encourage you, share something from that. What, what was God speaking to you? We also talked about being devoted to fellowship. And the word that we used it with fellowship, the original work in the, word in the Greek is koinonia. And that week we talked about kendama and my son and his kendamas. And some of you might remember that. Some of you tried that. And it's not easy to do, that for sure. But we talked about spending time together. And that word koinonia, we're going to come back to that today as we finish the series. But it's about fully sharing. And then we talked about being devoted to food. And uh, Pastor Bobby, we will never look at Pringles the same way again. And uh, if, if things in the ministry don't ever work out, you've got a, a, a perfect job on a cruise boat somewhere singing, singing lullabies or what would you call it, a ballad? Sure. A ballad, whatever. Um, this is a true story. Uh, we... Uh, my wife and I were celebrating our anniversary. We were on a little getaway uh, the last few days. And uh, Jessica's like, hey, what kind of snacks do you want? You want some Pringles? I said, no, no, no. It's too soon to get Pringles. It's going to take some time. It's going to take some time. But that was awesome. And, uh, and then today is the conclusion of our devoted series. And we were, I was thinking, okay, what's a creative way? What, could, well, what else can we do? And, and I was just saying, I Googled. I said, crazy things that people are devoted to. And uh, there was a short list that came up, and I want to share a couple of those. And I've got to squeal on myself on the first one. The first one was that there's a guy, he's devoted to cheese painting. And I literally thought until this morning that he was taking blocks of cheese and like painting the cheese. But Bonnie was like, no, 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 he's actually painting cheese. And either way, it's a weird thing to be devoted. How many would agree that's a little out there? Okay, second one, uh, not only che uh, cheese painting, the second one on the list was eating roadkill. Come on. This guy eats roadkill for dinner. In fact, there's another picture in the article that I saw that he, he had Thanksgiving dinner, and it, it was all different pieces of roadkill that's disgusting. If you think that's disgusting, say amen. amen. All right, I'm in the right place. All right, next guy, this not so weird, but ski maps. He's, this guy is devoted to ski maps. Oh, no, I went too far. Uh, ultimate cat lady. Oh, this would only happen in California, and I can tease it because I was just there in California. But this lady, she had a heart for cats, and her cat population was growing. And how many know you normally call uh, services, and they come and, like, remove the cats? But in California, they gave her permission to have a cat sanctuary in her property. She has well over 200 cats on her property. Um, she's devoted to her cats. Um, is there any cat lovers in the room? Um, any cat, thank you, I see some th thumbs downs. Um, any cat lovers have an affinity towards more than one cat? Okay, oh, you got two, all right. But choose the limit, choose the limit. Okay, choose the limit. Anybody have more than two cats? Oh, boy. Oh, boy, I'm not, I can't go there. It's one of my board members. All right, okay, well, I better just keep on going on. All right, okay. I was going to say something, but I'll regret it. Uh, so we'll just hold that one. And Jessica's not even here to stop me. And, uh, I'm, and uh, I must be growing up. All right, good. Next one, ski maps. This guy, this is not as weird, but this guy has devoted his life to uh, drawing 
ski routes on mountains. How many have ever been snow skiing before? And you appreciate the map, you know, saying which ski, ski hill. Well, there's this guy that he's devoted his life. That's all he does for a living. And he goes around and he, he draws ski maps. And then the last one, it's, it's a little strange too, snake venom. This guy, he gets snakes, he milks them, which I didn't even know that was possible. He milks them and then, get this, he injects the poison into his own bloodstream, and it's an actual thing. He is actually being tested for to, so he can kind of help with vaccinations and other things, and this guy is devoted to his craft, a little out there, but there are things that we are devoted to, but come on, church, we're not devoted to snakes or to cats, come on, sorry, or ski maps or anything else like that. We are devoted to four things, the Bible says, to Scripture, to meals, to fellowship, and to prayer and worship. We're going to see that today. I want you to stand with me. We're going to read from God's Word in uh, Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42, says this, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. And that's what we're going to talk about today. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions, and they shared their money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Church, before you're seated, this has been a series all around the idea of spiritual growth, discipleship. How do we grow as a body, a community together? We see in Acts chapter 1, verse 14, and I'll have you seated here in a second, I promise. It says they all met together and were constantly united in prayer. That's talking about the 120 in the upper room. Isolation's not good. At the beginning of time, it wasn't good with Adam and Eve. It's not good today. And today, we're going to fully understand what koinonia means, fully sharing, even in prayer. Lord, help us. Lord, I pray right now that once again, that these few verses would come alive. And not only for today, but God, I pray that it would make a difference in our lives long term. Lord, that we put some things into practice. Things would be different and that we would grow. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. How many of you were here at the beginning of 2023 and you remember we started the, church, the, the year with a series on prayer. We did the 40-day prayer challenge. We did six weeks of prayer. We talked about a lot of things that prayer moves the heart of God. We said that the answer to every prayer was more of the Holy Spirit. So if you need more power, you need more Holy Spirit. If you need more wisdom, you need more Holy Spirit. If you want to flow in the fruit of the Spirit, you need more of the Holy Spirit. We talked about dreaming big and persistence and supercharging our prayers. And we talked about A-L-A-T, as long as it takes. And not ASAP prayers, not as, God, we need this and we need it now, right? We don't get to control that. God is sovereign and we, it's never too late to stop or to give up praying, right? We, we need to continue to pray. We need to pray through. And today we are going to conclude our devoted series coming back to this idea of of prayer. And so far in this series, for me, the big takeaway is that word koinonia, which I talked about a couple weeks ago. And really today is the culmination of koinonia, a community of prayer concept, sharing fully, even in our prayer. It's so powerful. And how many of you know that our hearts grow for the things we pray for, right? That is the truth. And today, we want to see kind of a case, build a case, how prayer is not an option 
in our lives. We have to pray. Come on, say it with me. Prayer is not an option. Prayer is not an option. And today, we're going to see how there's a regular theme through the book of Luke and Acts. By the way, that's one of the disciples. His name was Luke. He wrote Luke and Acts. It's kind of one body or one piece of literature. They broke it up into two different books. But uh, Craig Keener, uh, Pastor uh, Bobby, sent me a note. Uh, he's a... He's a um, uh, an apo- not apologetic, but he's a, a theologian, thank you. He says this. He says, although not unique in Luke's work, Luke and Acts, prayer is a regular theme in Luke and Acts. And then we're going to see how it's even through the end of the New Testament today. He says, indeed, the interpreters have argued that prayer is viewed as the method through which God accomplishes his purposes and directs history. That's the power of prayer. It affects destiny. It helps accomplish his purposes. Prayer is not optional. And certainly we see it in the early church, and we're going to get there in a minute, but I want to back up and look at Jesus and his example with prayer first. So how many know Jesus is always a good example? How many know when you ask your kids, what did you learn today in church? Uh, Jesus, it's always the right answer. I mean, and so let's start there. Luke chapter 5, verse 16 says this, but Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. I love that he gets away in solitude, in silence. In Luke chapter 6, it says one day soon after Jesus went up on the mountain to pray, and he prayed to God all night long. At daybreak, he called together all his disciples, and he chose 12 of them to be apostles. And so how many know Jesus, he had a big decision in front of him. Who were going to be his 12 disciples, apostles that were going to work with him? He prayed. He got away. He rested. When you think about resting in solitude and silence and listening and in regards to prayer and being in the presence of God, we often put, use the term abiding, abiding with God. And I used this quote back in our series earlier this year, that you will never hear the voice of God or the call of Jesus if you do not spend time in Scripture and in prayer. And prayer is not just talking, it's also listening. You cannot hear from God if you're not quiet. And how many of you can just be honest that there's some noise in our lives that we need to turn down at times. We all struggle with this at times. In Luke chapter 11, when we think about Jesus and his example, we see that he's a powerful example, but he's prayed all night. Uh, And then Jesus, at one point in verse 1, it says that once Jesus was was in a certain place praying, no surprise, as he finished, one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, Teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. And so there was something powerful, something different about the way Jesus prayed. And then in Luke, this is his, the Lord's prayer from Luke's perspective. Said so Jesus said this, this is how you should pray. Father, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. Give us each day the food we need and forgive us our sins. And we forgive those who sin against us. And... Don't let us yield to temptation. Jesus was a great example for us to follow when it comes to prayer. But it didn't stop with just Jesus. The early church, they picked up that example. In fact, they were encouraged to pray. Luke 24, this is after Jesus uh, comes back from the grave. He, He dies, he's buried, he comes back. And what does he tell his disciples to do? He says, and now I will send the Holy Spirit just as the Father promised. But stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. You say, well, what were they doing? This is the upper room experience, right? The 120 were together. They weren't watching Netflix. They weren't playing charades, I can guarantee you. They were praying. In fact, the verse I read before we prayed, uh, Acts 1.14 says they met together and were constantly united in prayer. And then you move into Acts chapter 2. Some of you know the story. It's the day of Pentecost. Why did the day of Pentecost come? 
is because they prayed and they waited on the Holy Spirit. It was a result of prayer and a result of waiting. And there were signs and wonders. They worshiped God together. And of course, we know that after the Spirit of God fell, they began to speak in other tongues. Peter stands up where he, before he was denying that he even knew Jesus. And now he's got all this confidence through prayer, through the Holy Spirit. And he gives a great word. And uh, he tells the gospel story. 3,000 people are saved and baptized in that moment. I mean, what a moment to, to, to celebrate. And then at the end of chapter 2 of Acts, it's kind of like this moment. Like, wow, that, this is incredible. It's like, now what? Now what do we do? And we get the answer in our key verse for this whole series. Acts 2, 42, all the believers were devoted to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to sharing meals, and to prayer. And it started a pattern of prayer, for sure, to follow. Not only the Jesus in the early church, we see in Acts chapter 4, all the believers were together. They were praying a corporate prayer together for courage. Uh, Peter and John had been arrested, and once they were released, they found their people. They found koinonia, so to speak, and they prayed a prayer against the opposition you can read it in Acts chapter 4, verses 23 through 31. They were prayed for boldness to share. They prayed for miracles. And it says in verse 31, after they prayed these things, the meeting place shook, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they preached the word of God with boldness. Prayer was not an option for Jesus or for the early church. And you say, well, what about the rest of the New Testament? Well, we see that the rest of the New Testament, we see prayer as a priority as well. In fact, in almost every letter or, or a writing that Paul did, at the end of his letters, he's encouraging the people to pray. Let me give you four examples. You can write these down. We'll get, go through them real quick. The first is Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 10 says, a final word. He's wrapping up his thoughts to the church in Ephesus. He says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And then from verse 11 to verse 17, it's the armor of God. Put on the armor of God. And then he comes back, almost like two bookends. He says, pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all the believers everywhere. So as a final word, he says, look, you must be prayer warriors. Philippians chapter 4, wrapping up the, church, the letter to the Philippian church. In verse 6 says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. We see it in Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. Uh, Devote yourselves to prayer and, and, and have an alert mind and a thankful heart. Heart. Again, prayer is the priority. And then 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. This is a verse we can all memorize before we leave. I will say this. If you memorize this, I'm not giving you $10. This verse is three words. Never stop praying. Let's memorize it together right now. Never stop praying. Close your eyes. and let's. If you haven't memorized, say it with me. Never stop praying. Good job. James Item has got $10 for each of you. All right, just see him after service. <laughs> this verse, he's wrapping up his words to the church in Thessalonica, right? Never stop praying. And it ne doesn't it stop there. It doesn't fade throughout the, all the epistles. It's like pray for this, pray for that. Sometimes it even seemed insignificant. How many know our insignificant prayers, the little things, it all adds up, right? We are called to pray without ceasing. Sometimes we feel like we're boring people when we ask them to pray for them. Listen, that is not true, not even for a second. When we pray, we pray for someone else, we're devoted, it makes a difference. And then the classic example, I'll just read it, and then it's the most powerful tool in our spiritual arsenal of prayer is James chapter 5, verse 13 says this, any of you struggling hardships, you should, say it with me, pray. Is anyone happy? You should sing praises. Is anyone sick? You should call the elders of the church and to come and to 
pray over you, anoint you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick person. The Lord will make you well. And if you have committed any sins, you will be forgiven. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. And then there's an example of Elijah. We've talked about that in uh, uh, our previous series. It was a great example. It says, Elijah was a human just as we are, and yet when he prayed earnestly that there would be no rainfall, none fell for three and a half years. Crazy story from 1 Kings. You can look it up. Then when he prayed again, and uh, the sky sent down rain, and the earth began to yield its crop. The point is that it's the most powerful tool in our spiritual arsenal. So, this series has been about being devoted. And let's just go back to the very beginning. We asked the question, how do we know if someone is devoted? Well, we knew that James, with all those bikes, was devoted because that was his passion. He spent time on it. He spent money on it. And I put in my notes, this doesn't reply to you, uh, but uh, when someone's passionate about something, when they're devoted to something, sometimes it's hard to shut them up about it, right? Like they just talk about it, talk about it, and uh, I get teased about that. H hold on. Did he just say CrossFit? No. Oh, okay, all right, yeah. Because Bobby's always teasing me and Pastor Sean for doing CrossFit. He's like, if you're, if you're doing CrossFit, uh, it must be a rule that you have to talk about it all the time. And he's just jealous. He's just jealous. That's all I'm saying. But, uh, but anyway, but how, you, know, you know someone's devoted when they're passionate, they're spending time, their money, they won't stop talking about it. And when we come to prayer and the idea that prayer is not optional, and I'm not going to stop saying that today, that's our, that's our key, but being devoted to prayer, how would we know if someone was devoted to prayer? It's not rocket science. They would be passionate about prayer. There would be an expectancy. They would spend time praying. They're going to talk about it. They're going to include others. They're not going to shut up about it, right? I loved it. Pastor Sean last uh, week noticed that one of the missionaries that were, uh, the missionary couples, uh, Mark, uh, who didn't preach, his wife preached, but Mark, you caught him praying for people four or five different times. He prayed for me. He said, hey, Pastor Ben, can I pray for you before we go? I'm like, yes, of course. I mean, he was devoted to prayer, a great example. Speaking of Pastor Sean, this whole idea that prayer is not optional. In fact, let's say that together. Prayer is not optional came from your youth email this week. Not directly, but in the email that he sent out to all the parents, which, by the way, parents, that is a treasure Pay attention so you're not behind, so you can get your kids uh, up to date with everything. In his email, I read, he said that what's optional in one generation becomes unnecessary in the next generation. And the context of your letter was, you were talking about camps. That, man, if, if we don't make camp a, a priority, uh, it, the, it's scary that the next generation will think it's unnecessary. And that's not the case here at the Gateway Church. In fact, we've been growing in numbers. Camps are a priority. And I think we've got 50 kids going to camp this summer between junior high, high school, and elementary camp. That is, will be the most we've ever sent this year. And so we've seen some growth there. And by the way, um, my, growing up, my grandma made it possible for me to go to camp. Um, the same grandma that said, hey, I'll give you $5 for memorizing Psalm 1. And by the way, today is the last day for your kids, uh, 18 and under. To, if you come and tell me, I'm prepared to give you $10 from me, $10 from Grandma, and then hopefully your parents are in on it too. So 30 bucks is a good deal for the kids that memorize the verses. But I was just saying, my grandma, the same grandma that gave the $5, to, she knew camp was important. And I know that we've reached out to a few families, a few key stakeholders that are uh, passionate about kids. And man, we need your help. We got a bunch of kids that we're scholarshipping and helping to get to camp. And uh, it makes an absolute difference. It just does. And so thank you in advance for your giving. But the quote that Pastor Sean, and this is in, in direct quote, he says, what one generation finds optional, 
the next generation will find unnecessary. So, grandmas and grandpas, if prayer is just an option, it's not necessary in the next generation. Moms and dads, if prayer is not a priority with your kids, it will become unnecessary. That is a sobering thought. Prayer is not optional. And so the question today is, are you devoted to pray, to prayer? How much time do you pray? How much passion is there around prayer? How much expectancy when you do pray do you believe that God's going to move? How much do you talk about it? Are you devoted to prayer? Did a little research this week, and Christians in America enjoy about five hours and 16 minutes of leisure per day on average. So that would take into account to empty nesters or like uh, retired people uh, that don't work. And, but five hours, 16 minutes of leisure per day. That, that's quite a bit of time. But on average, Christians in America spend an average of eight minutes a day praying. I actually thought that was kind of high. I thought it might be lower, but eight minutes according to this one study. You put that in contrast to how much time an, um, the average American spends on their phone, oof, it's, it hurts. Three hours, 15 minutes. And Pastor Sean, love you, brother, he was just bragging. He's like, hey, I got my screen time down to right around three hours. You know, and he's like, I'm doing better. I'm like, okay, that's good. And yes, our phones can be helpful, and they can be time savers. And you can do work, and you can do school, and random, you can look up random facts on what people are devoted to um, on your phone. <laughs> And, uh, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about prayer, being devoted to prayer. And I'm curious, do you even want to be devoted to pray? At the beginning of the series, we said this series is about spiritual growth. It's about discipleship. Well, the truth is, if you want to grow in your walk with the Lord, you must mobilize the most powerful tool you have. That's prayer. Ephesians 6.18, pray in the Spirit at all times. It is not optional. And we can talk about it personally, but in the context of Acts chapter 2, our key verse, it's talking about corporate prayer, being together, praying. So we're not counting even. I mean, it counts, but, but praying by yourself, that's one thing. Being together in prayer is critical. And that just begs the question, what would a community look like that's devoted to prayer? Not only for each other, but with one another. One word comes to mind, and no surprise, it's the word koinonia. Koinonia, in the, in the English, it's, go, it's fellowship that we talked about a couple weeks ago. But really, that's incomplete. Koinonia means sharing fully including in prayer. Koinonia is a word that describes the church. So fellowship is the result of koinonia. Prayer is the result of koinonia. Sharing fully everything, our lives, our possessions, our heart, our time, our prayer. Sharing a piece of ourselves with, with others, our hurts and our pains, our prayers, our insecurities. We forgive, we love, we challenge, we confront in godly ways. All of that is wrapped up in the biblical idea of koinonia. And the result of koinonia is spiritual growth. I'm going to ask the worship team to join me. When we think of spiritually mature people, they know how to share. Share their possessions, share their time, they know how to share in prayer. Spiritual infants need to learn these things. They need to learn to koinonia. And in this series, we have provided some opportunities. And 
the lion's share of us have participated in some of these events. We had a men's event, a women's event. We had a well-seasoned events. That's for our 55 and up group. We had young adults getting together. We had our kids getting together. All strategic just to be the church. We actually have two events for men and women. One for men in August. We have a men's retreat. And then we have in August, is it September? In September, we have a women's conference. But ladies, I just will say, we're, you're hearing a little bit about it. Well, we probably need to spend some time really laying out what that is. This is not the time to do that. But uh, we need to know probably within the next few weeks if you're in uh, so we can get all the arrangements for they want to do some Airbnbs. And it's going to be in Detroit, in Novi. It's going to be awesome. And, and, and again, these are ways we're trying to say, hey, we need to be together. Let's do this together. When we think about koinonia, there's opportunities we give to go deeper in commitment. We've got a membership class coming up June 11th. Today, we've got a class right after service called Get Connected, and you're invited. If you've not gone through Get Connected, or if you're new here at the Gateway Church, you are invited to stay. We've got child care lined up. We're, we will feed you, and it's a couple hours of your life. It will, it's going to help you understand who we are as a church, but it's also going to dive into your gifts and your unique opportunities to come alongside us because koinonia means sharing the load of serving as well. With those that do serve, in the month of June, July, and August, we're going to be rolling out a ministry handbook. Again, just another way to kind of help us be the church, give some guidelines, keep us heading in the right direction, so you can be looking for that. And then I want to come back to this idea that prayer is not optional. This Wednesday night, really, it's the final thing. If you still have this on your fridge, it's the very last statement. On May 24th, we are going to be together and we're going to experience koinonia together. It says 7 o'clock, but as we are putting the final details of what that night's going to look like, we backed it up to 6.30. We, want, we know that this will be a disruption to a lot of families that are not used to coming to church on Wednesday night because we don't have stuff for kids on Wednesday night. Our youth group, they're going to come. They'll be, they'll be great, no problem. And Pastor Sean's going to work. But, but we're going to feed everybody pizza at 6.30. We don't want you to miss it. So get your family. Come on out. At 6.45, we're going to provide child care for five and under. Elementary students, they'll be with us in worship like a normal Sunday morning. And then from 7 to 8 o'clock, we're going to worship and we're going to pray. We're going to be together. It's going to be a picture of Coin in the End. We haven't done a worship night just us in a long time. But we want you to come out. If it's not already on your calendar, would you make it a priority? It's so important. That night, we're going to have the older generation praying with the younger generation. We want students to be there, child care, all these things. So, prayer. Prayer is not optional. We need it. We need it. This morning, as I bring this to a close, I know that the need is great in our lives and in those around we can be part of the answer when we pray, when we pray for others, when we pray for each other. The need for breakthrough, for miracles, for intervention, for transformation, for salvations. This morning, I want you to just bow your head and close your eyes. And I just want to go back to that question. Are you devoted to prayer? even want to be devoted to prayer. And if the answer is yes, I want to ask a second question and I want us to respond in a physical way. If you answered yes, I want to be devoted to prayer. The next question is, do you have room to grow in your prayer life? 
And if the answer is yes, I want you to stand right where you are. Right where you are. Yeah. And that probably would be most of us. I don't think any of us are hidden 100%. Church, prayer is not optional. We are called to be people of prayer. We're going to close. Well, actually, I'm going to let Pastor Bobby introduce this last song. It was strategic to wrap up this series. And uh, it re- allows us. And, and maybe, Pastor Bobby, I thought, and we didn't talk between services, but um, maybe there's an opportunity before we leave uh, that if the Lord puts someone on your heart to pray for, even in this moment, uh, that would be appropriate. The song we're going to be closing with is one that is called uh, With You. And sometimes when we sing worship songs, uh, they're worship songs about God. But when we have the opportunity to sing songs to God, it it changes the nature of that song from worship uh, to then sung prayers. And and every now and then we'll, we'll say a prayer together whenever maybe someone accepts the Lord or something like that. But my guess is oftentimes when we're worshiping together, we don't think of those songs that we're singing to God as corporate prayers that we're actually reciting and proclaiming in unity together. And so as we go into this last song, I want you to think of every word, uh, not just as a personal prayer, but as a corporate prayer. And there's a point in the bridge that kind of wraps all of this up where it says, so let all that I am be consumed with who you are. And that's what being devoted is, uh, being committed. It's saying, let everything that I am, it's yours. Just take it all. And so with that, uh, will you just close your eyes before we sing this song? And let's just focus our hearts on the Lord today. Let's just take a moment before we close today to just be in his presence. everything. Let us freely give back with open hands, with open hearts. Lord, use us and speak to us. Lord, I pray this morning for those who feel like they have nothing to give. And Lord, I know that there are some who maybe feel like they don't have anything worth contributing. Maybe they feel worthless or useless, Lord, I pray that you would just encourage them, Lord, that you would show them areas that they weren't even aware, how you've gifted them, how you've empowered them, the circle of influence that you've surrounded them with. Lord, and I pray for those who feel like they don't have anything to give because they're on empty. Lord, through this series, help Help teach us, Lord, not to just be filled once a week on Sunday morning and leave and come back empty every week, Lord. But Lord, teach us rhythms to put in our life. Lord, in a world that is so crazy and so busy and so full, let us be people who are able to be present. Not just present with you, but present with others present in the moment, not worried about what we have going on after this, what is going on next in our life, but able to just sit in where we are now, Lord. Lord, for those who are empty, I pray that you would fill them up, Lord, but I also pray that you would help show them how they can be filled throughout the week. 
Lord, that this wouldn't be something that we would come to every week and gorge ourselves on your presence and, and then leave this place and then and want to hold it for ourselves because we're afraid that we're going to run dry or run on empty, Lord. But let us be people that your spirit is continually filling us up to overflowing so that we have more than enough to pour out, to share to others. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for what you've done, what you are doing, and what you're going to do. And we know that as we leave this place linked arm in arm as people in Koinonia, Lord, that we are going into a world that has subverted and perverted, Lord, your mission. Lord, that we are going to a lost, hurting, and broken world, Lord, as salt and light, Lord. Let us be people with healing hands. Let us be people who speak truth and love. And let us be people that not just love with word or mouth, but in action and in truth, Lord. We leave today as your ambassadors, as your kingdom people. And Lord, we give you all the praise and glory and honor for what you have done and what you will do in and through us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, for being part of our devoted series. You guys can go in the grace of God, and we look forward to worshiping with you Wednesday night. We hope to see you there. Thank you for listening to this week's message from the Gateway Church. If you'd like to find out more about our church, such as service times, giving, and ways to get connected, visit us at thegateway.church.